Psalm 137 is a mournful song of the Jewish exiles. Because this psalm is a remembrance of Babylon, many commentators believe that it was written after the return from exile. Uh, It also may have been, been written many years into the exile. So here is a sad psalm remembering Uh, prior glories, and the present distress. Here we go, the first three verses of Psalm 137, where we read, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there, those who carried us away captive asked of us a song, And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. This song of the exile puts us on the shore of one of Babylon's mighty rivers, likely the Euphrates. So it says, By the rivers of Babylon. Judea and the whole of Israel had no mighty river comparable to the Euphrates. So it would certainly make an impression upon the forced refugee from Judea to Babylonia. There he is by the rivers of Babylon, and these might have been the Tigris or the Euphrates or one of their branches. There was an extensive series of canals and waterways throughout Babylon. Mention of this is made in many different places. There they are gathered, perhaps they're gathered, much as the Jewish people were gathered in Acts chapter 16, where the Jews of Philippi uh, gathered by a riverside where they could make uh, prayer and and have something of a service there. And based on verse 1, Bishop Horn, the Anglican commentator of a couple hundred years ago, he suggested this cry of mourning from the repentant one. This was his suggested prayer. O Lord, I am an Israelite, exiled by my sins from your holy city and left here to mourn in this Babylon, the land of my captivity. Here I dwell in sorrow by these transient waters, musing the restless and unstable nature of earthly pleasures. You see, they were so stricken with grief. It says there, verse 1, there we sat down, yea, we wept. The immense rivers of Babylon said to the exiled one, you're not home anymore. There's nothing like this in Jerusalem, in Zion. And when they remembered that, they were so overcome with grief first that they couldn't stand any longer. It says, there we sat down in verse 1, and then they wept. What did they weep over? They wept over the death of so many loved ones when Judea and Jerusalem were conquered. They wept over the loss of almost everything that they owned. They wept over the destroyed city of Jerusalem and her great temple. They wept over the agony of a forced march from Judea to Babylon. They wept over the cruelty of their captors. They wept over the loss of such a pleasant and blessed past. They wept over the forced captivity of their present. They wept over the bleak nature of their future. They wept over their sin that invited such judgment from God. Now, James Montgomery Boyce points out, that the English words that we read here in the first few verses of Psalm 137, the English words are sad, even mournful, but the words have an even sadder sound in the Hebrew language. Again, this is according to James Montgomery Boyce. Verses 1 through 3, which lead up to and explain the pathetic question of verse 4, repeat nine times the pronoun ending nu, meaning we or our, which sounds mournful. It's like crying, oh, or woe, repeatedly. So what did they do? Verse 2, we hung our harps upon the willows. 
the singer used poetic liberty to present a striking scene. Large willow trees grew on the shores of the great river, and because there were no songs left in these captives, what's the point of having harps? So hang your harps on those willow trees. You don't need to use them. There's no songs left to sing. And even though they were unable to sing, I love it that they didn't break their harps. They didn't throw them away. It's almost in hope that they hung their harps upon the willow trees, feeling it's not always going to be like this. Later, when God restores, when God brings a better day, we'll be able to sing. Not today, but later. Now, verse 3 says, For there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth, again, the end of verse 3, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. This was the cruel demand of those who carried us away captive. They asked for one of the famous songs of Zion. The same ones who plundered the people of God now wanted them to entertain them. Yet there was no song left in them. Their harps had been hung in the trees. It's as if they're in the midst of a bunch of drunk partiers. And the drunk partiers are yelling at them, sing, sing a song for us. And that request, as Alexander McLaren says, that request drove the iron deeper into sad hearts. For it came from those who have made the misery. They had been led away the captives, and now they bid them make sport. Entertain us, if you will. Derek Kidner says that there is a relief from Sennacherib's palace at Nineveh in the neighboring land of Assyria, and it portrays a situation similar to this with three prisoners of war playing lyres or harps as they are marched along by an armed soldier. Now notice, they did not sing, as the following lines are going to show us, they could not sing. But I really appreciate the point of G. Campbell Morgan here. He says, even though they did not and could not sing, yet, Morgan says, there was a song in the silence, not heard of the cruel oppressors, but heard of Jehovah himself. It was the song of the heart, remembering Jerusalem, counting it the chief joy of life. Now, notice here, starting at verse 4, is the vow of the psalmist to remember Jerusalem, even in exile. Verses 4, 5, and 6. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Even though the conquerors wanted them to sing for their own amusement, the song simply wasn't there. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? You see, these songs of God's people were supposed to be more than performances. They were supposed to come from their relationship with God, and it would take a long time for them to have a sense of restored relationship with God and to be able to sing those songs in a foreign land. F.B. Meyer took this idea of not being able to sing, and he used it as an admonishment for Christians. This is what F.B. Meyer said. He said, you have ceased singing lately. The joy of your religious life has vanished. You pass through the old routine, but without the exhilaration of former days. Can you not tell the reason? It is not because your circumstances are depressed, though they may be. For Paul and Silas sang praises to God in their prisons. Is not disobedience at the root of your songlessness? You have allowed some little rift to come within the lute of your life, 
which has been slowly widening and now threatens to silence all. And you never will be able to resume that song until you have put away the evil of your doing and have returned from the land of the enemy. Certainly that idea of F.B. Meyer doesn't apply to every situation, but it applies to many situations. The reason for our sadness, the reason for our inability to sing the songs of God with a joyful and an exhilarated heart is because there's some sin affecting our relationship with God. Now, the psalmist here in Psalm 137 made a vow. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. That's what he says in verse 5. The singer vowed that he would never forget God's holy city. And he even gave a curse upon himself if he did. If he did forget, then let his right hand lose all of its skill to play the harp. If he failed to remember, then his tongue would lose its ability to sing, as he says here in verse 6. Willem van Gemeren says, that the godly could not forget Jerusalem and everything it stands for. Covenant, temple, presence, and kingship of God, atonement, forgiveness, and reconciliation. They vowed never to forget God's promises and to persevere waiting for the moment of redemption. The Puritan commentator John Trapp, he, he lived from the year 1601 to the year 1699, He observed this about the Jewish people of his time. He said this, the Jews at this day, and remember, he's writing in the 17th century. The Jews at this day, when they build a house, they are, say the rabbis, to leave one part of it unfinished and lying rude in remembrance that Jerusalem and the temple are at present desolate. That's interesting, isn't it? He quotes here this idea that they were to remember and never forget the desolation of Jerusalem. Well, in the 20th century, the Jewish people came back to the land in great numbers. They they never completely left, but they came back in the land in far greater numbers in the 20th century. And in some sense, Israel and Jerusalem has been restored, but The temple has never been restored. And more importantly, the spiritual life of the people has never been fully restored. There is a sense in which they are still strangers in a land because they have not truly submitted as a whole unto God and unto Jesus Christ, the perfect representation of the God of Israel. Now, starting at verse 7, he's going to sing about the nations. Here here we go, verse 7. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. Here we see the psalmist asking God to remember something. Remember something against the sons of Edom, this neighboring pagan nation that was actually descended from the uh, son of Isaac known as Esau. Esau was a brother to Jacob. The descendants of Esau were the Edomites. And the Edomites were the neighbors of the Jewish people, but they were also very bitter rivals of the Jewish people. The Edomites were proverbial for their hatred of their near neighbor, indeed virtually the cousins, of themselves, the people of Israel. So therefore, the psalmist asked God to remember against the sons of Edom what they did. Directing his words to God, he asked God to remember the people of Edom for their conduct during the conquest of Jerusalem. In this case, the call was to remember was a call for God to oppose and to judge the Edomites because enthusiastically the Edomites said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation, destroy Jerusalem. They greeted the destruction of Jerusalem with joy and they may very well have shared in that destruction as soldiers 
in Nebuchadnezzar's army. The small book of the prophet Obadiah is a prophetic pronouncement against the Edomites for their part in the conquest of Judea. It says here in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 12, Nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of their distress. But they did. Even crying out, as it says there in verse 7, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. Even though the Edomites were a sister or cousin nation to Israel, having descended from Esau, the brother of Jacob, they should have supported and sympathized with Jerusalem when the Babylonians came against it. Instead, they enjoyed Jerusalem's agony and they wanted the city to be completely destroyed. Therefore, the psalmist calls upon God to bring judgment against them. When he says, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, he's not wishing for good upon the Edomites. He's wishing for judgment upon them. Now, this same thought is continued or even intensified in verses 8 and 9, which conclude Psalm 137, where we read this. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Verse 8 cries out, O daughter of Babylon, speaking to the Babylonians, who are to be destroyed. The psalmist directed his words to future generations of the Babylonian empire, giving them notice that they themselves would be destroyed in God's judgment. Now notice, the psalmist did not make this a prayer to God as he did regarding Edom in the previous verse. Perhaps he regarded the judgment of Babylon to be so certain that he didn't need to pray about it. He just needed to make this pronouncement, especially in light of other prophecies, such as we find in that small prophetic book of Obadiah. What does he say? Verse 8, Happy the one who repays you as you have served us. This is a blessing on the one who brings judgment against the Babylonians, and a judgment corresponding to what the Babylonians served unto Jerusalem and Judea. You see, there's plenty of evidence that when he says, dash your little ones against the rock, he's just asking that God would bless the ones who do to the Babylonians what the Babylonians did against Jerusalem and Judea. Lord, give to them what they gave to us. And whoever does that, you bless them, Lord. That's why the strong and startling statement of verse 9, happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. This awful blessing, if you could call it that, is understood in light of the previous line, no doubt the singer had seen this done to the little ones of Jerusalem and that horrible image of the children, the babies of Israel, of Judea, being thrown against the rocks and murdered. That image was seared upon his mind and he prayed that the Babylonians would get as they had given. Now, we sympathize with the impulse of the psalmist. When evil has been committed against us, we want the same evil to come against those who have hurt us. Yet, the New Testament calls us to a higher standard, a response of instead of calling down judgment, we would pray down reconciliation. But again, we should understand what's being said here. 
This is a man who has been greatly traumatized by the judgment he saw coming through the Babylonians. He wants the same judgment to be put upon them. I like what Alexander McLaren said. He said, perhaps if some of their modern critics had been under the yoke from which this psalmist had been delivered, they would have understood a little better how a good man of that age could rejoice that Babylon was fallen and all its race eliminated. Or he says here, as Spurgeon says, let those who find fault with it who have never seen their temple burned, their city ruined, their wives ravished, and their children slain, they might not, perhaps, be quite so velvet-mouthed if they had suffered after this fashion. It's true. Now, it may be, also, that the psalmist had known of Isaiah's prophecy that announced that just this would happen. In Isaiah chapter 13, verse 16, he's pronouncing judgment against Babylon, and he says, their children also will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Brothers and sisters, it may very well be that the psalmist just understood this prophecy and said, well, Lord, you had said this is going to happen. Fulfill your word in judgment against the Babylonians. But God did. If you take a look at the cities and fortresses of ancient Edom, they're desolate. They're ruins. If you take a look at the site of ancient Babylon, it's nothing. It's a ruin. God will execute his judgment and he cannot be mocked. Now, at the end of this sad psalm, we can ask ourselves, how does Psalm 137 point to Jesus? Let me suggest to you a couple of ways. First, Jesus shows great compassion to the brokenhearted. You remember how this psalm begins by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. To those in this kind of broken-hearted state, Jesus is the comfort and the grace and the compassion of God. As it says in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When we are broken hearted, just as is reflected in this psalm, we can draw close to Jesus and find his comfort and restoration. We worship a Savior, Jesus Christ, who knew what it was like to be brokenhearted himself, so he can sympathize with us and encourage us along those very same lines. Secondly, we see Jesus in Psalm 137 because Jesus taught and lived the opposite of vengeance. Sometimes we see Jesus in these Psalms by contrast. The, the prayer of verse 8 and 9 of Psalm 134 is clear enough. Basically, this is the prayer. Lord, do to them what they have done to us. Now, that's normal. One might even say that it is deserved or a reserved prayer. Because usually we want to repay someone with more harm than they have done against us. Yet, look how Jesus rose above this natural inclination of humanity. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, Jesus said, I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That is a higher way, a greater way. Jesus taught the opposite of vengeance. But he didn't just teach it. He also lived it. 
Do you remember those words from Luke chapter 23, verse 34, what Jesus said as they nailed him to the cross? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Honestly, the spirit of Psalm 137 said, Lord, you give unto them what they're giving unto me right now. And that's justice in its purest terms. We don't deny it. But Jesus, with the incalculable love of God, not only taught the opposite of vengeance, he practiced it with his life. And aren't we grateful for that? Hey, Jesus can draw near to you even in your broken-hearted condition. Let's pray just for that and worship him for it. Father in heaven, we're so grateful that we serve a sympathetic Savior and that he fills our life and brings the comfort of God to us. So, Lord God, we worship you. We honor you. We receive from you this comfort and the ability to love our enemies in a way, Lord, that is sort of beyond the conception of the author of Psalm 137. Thank you, Lord, for being near to the brokenhearted and by giving them the comfort that is found in Jesus Christ. We want to receive it by faith. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.